bleeding or subbleeding jet. It actually was shown that digestive symmetry was uh, really uh, related to the mass to momentum ratio, which is a proxy for the number of vacuum splittings. Once the hardest emission within the angular scale of a jet is uh, given, this sets a very important scale of the jet, such as its mass, and it determines the, the future phase space of such jet. This is one of the most important aspects, this vacuum-like part of the physics to understand digital asymmetry in dual and in many other models. We also uh, learn that uh, jet suppression and other suppression, the difference that uh, is seen in data and also in models, it can be accounted for by realizing that the leading partons in the Hadron spectrum the other spectrum is dominated by the leading partons of narrow jets because of the steeply falling spectrum. And the narrow jets, as I, we were saying before, they have a smaller number of vacuum splittings, if you wish, they are more uh, narrow and they suffer less energy loss. So this gives a natural explanation for why jet suppression uh, is stronger than uh, for hadrons. Indeed, this is related to the jet fragmentation functions and uh, one leads to the other. The highest enhancement of the jet fragmentation functions can be understood also uh, through this multiparticle nature of jets. Uh, as another example, uh, we also learned that the groomed angle, which is in some sense the first or the hardest uh, Mm, uh, splitting in, uh, in the jet, it is modified in uh, heavy ion collisions. And what we see is that there is, uh, uh, there is an enhanced contribution of narrower jets in, uh, in jet uh, in heavy ions compared to proton-proton. And this is due in the hybrid model and in other models as was shown to Alice's uh, note, it is due to a selection bias. And again, it is the wider jets, the ones that had a wider angle and therefore a wider phase space for further emissions, according to the, to the DGLAB logic that I showed in the first slide. These are the jets that get uh, more quenched and therefore they don't pass the cut, the jet PT cut due to the steeply falling spectrum. Um, here, um, in this paper, we showed that if you have a fully resolved shower, meaning that all the splittings, no matter what and which uh, conditions, just that they are formed, are quenched by the medium, uh, show very different, shows a very different uh, result than, than an unresolved shower where one assumes that only the global charge is quenched. This is, of course, um, uh, the first attempt within uh, to, to capture some of the coherence effects or resolution effects in a, in a jet Monte Carlo. And what you can see here is that this picture, according to this model, would be inconsistent with data. The quark to gluon difference because of the different quenching of the Casimirs uh, is actually contained here. And it does not suffice in this model to describe data. So clearly there is uh, something that is pointing to us that uh, there is a multi-pronged structure in a jet that uh, feels the effects of the medium and has to be taken into account. Uh, another important thing that Monte Carlos provide is that they typically include event by event pathlet uh, fluctuations. So in many analytical uh, attempts, not only uh, the jet has been considered as a single uh, global charge, but also the medium has been typically overly simplified. And Monte Carlos, uh, they typically include the even by the nature of jet quenching. However, there are uncontrolled assumptions about the interplay between the jet constituents and the medium. For instance, very important question is, which is the actual phase space of the vacuum-like emissions that can be resolved by the medium. This will depend on the jet PT, the cone radius R, and also coherence effects, which, as I was saying, have been largely neglected uh, in the literature, also in jet quenching Monte Carlos. 
one would also like to gain some control on which is the degree of sensitivity to the non-perturbative effects. So typically we um, regard non-perturbative effects as the hadronization effects, but in this case, we know that part of the energy becomes part of the medium and uh, what we can call hydrodynamization of jet energy, and this is better described. Uh, these uh, these non-perturbative scales are indeed better described by, uh, by hydrodynamics and don't belong to the perturbative region. So what we would like to have is some analytical results for jet suppression that have well-controlled uh, modeling assumptions to test the sensitivity of these different assumptions and improve our knowledge of uh, jet quenching phenomenology. So I will start um, by describing how can we describe uh, jets in vacuum uh, in an alternative way, not using uh, Monte Carlos, um, a particularly appealing uh, picture or framework is that of the generating functional framework, which was uh, recently exploited by uh, Dasgupta and friend sorry, from friends some years ago. And the relevant uh, quantity here is the inclusive distribution of microjets. Um, they uh, contain a fraction Z of the initial energy, a, fly, a flavor J uh, of uh, starting with a flavor I, so there's color conversion to the evolution and at a given scale t. So this microjet distribution, it can be shown that it trivially satisfies a DGLAP style evolution equation. And one can also see that it, one can easily relate it to the inclusive jet spectrum, where this quantity here, this, sig this sigma i dpt is the parton uh, cross-section uh, the hard, uh, the hard scattering and cross section from a two to two process. If one assumes that uh, such uh, scattering cross section, hard scattering cross section has a power law initial spectrum, then um, these uh, one can one can uh, define these uh, moments of the inclusive uh, microjet distribution. Then one can further interpret the scale T as an angular scale to leading uh, algorithmic accuracy. Many of these scales are analogous. There are uh, further improvements on, on these by Suarez and friends, but that's, I'm, I'm not gonna get into this here. I will stick to the more leading order picture. And uh, this is an angular scale in an angular order shower where uh, consecutive emissions are strongly ordered in angle. One can further use a running coupling constant to the one loop. And just here as an illustration, um, these are the equations that one ends up uh, having to solve uh, in terms of these moments of the microjet distribution. There is flavor conversion along the way. And essentially, it's interesting to see that uh, the microjet distributions, um, which are the lines, they compare well to PCI Monte Carlo. And this is vacuum. And what we are plotting here is the spectrum of a given radius R uh, divided by the spectrum at uh, radius one, which is the initial scale that we choose, um, that we match to the initial uh, hard scattering initial scan. So there is some sensitivity to this choice. One takes one or 1.5 was shown in this paper that it leads to uh, non-negligible effects. So there's further improvement to be done there uh, going to NLO, for instance. However, um, one can see that um, it's uh, reassuring to see that these approaches give uh, results that are equiparable to standard Monte Carlos. Essentially, one is doing the DIGLAP evolution up to a certain angular scale. That's basically all that's happening here. So now we move to uh, radiative energy loss. So there's not much um, I should uh, tell you about this. 
just a brief summary and introduction of the framework that will eventually be used in our uh, recent paper. The essential framework as we understand it with the modern techniques today is the light cone perturbation theory. And one can see that the integrated uh, medium induced spectrum by assuming, um, assuming that the medium is composed by a set of uh, scattering centers. Um, it was shown by uh, the seminal papers in the uh, end of the millennium and initial that one can uh, describe the integrated spectrum through this general form. This uh, kernel here, uh, this is the vacuum version of the kernel. This kernel here, it presumes the multiple interactions with the medium. The longitudinal modes are frozen. It's the transverse ones, the ones that are uh, dynamical in the chosen gauge, which is uh, a plus equal to zero. And uh, this kernel here satisfies this uh, 2D Schrodinger-like equation that features a potential. And this potential, it includes uh, the elastic scattering rate, which is typically modeled either through the hard thermal loop theory or the Gilasi Wong uh, theory. Okay. Then the usual approximations to solve the spectrum that one does um, are the following, very well known. If you have a dilute medium, you can expand to leading order in the potential, which is called the N equal one opacity expansion. And one recovers the Julassi Levi BTF spectrum that features the LPM suppression and it also includes the Peter Heitler regime when the formation time uh, of the emission is much more than the mean free path. This, um, this um, accounts for the physics of having a single hard scattering and it has the advantage that it can preserve the full form of the potential. And uh, on the other end, one has the harmonic oscillator or diffusion approximation in which the logarithmic part, logarithmic part of the potential is neglected by assuming that there's a constant scale that goes like the size of the dipole. And this potential here, it, um, both the Eulasi one and the hard thermal loop, they, they are uh, similar um, up above, uh, very similar above the, the screening mass uh, up to some, um, mapping between the, the corresponding uh, masses. So in essence, when one really focus is on the, on the leading one over Q to the fourth dependence of the elastic scattering rate when one computes these, uh, these potentials. Then the result is also very well known um, with the MPS or ASW spectrum in Right, it corresponds to a large medium when uh, multiple soft interactions have been resolved. However, the potential has been uh, approximated to some degree. Now, there recently has been uh, a different approach that tries to cover both these regimes in a consistent way. It's called the improved opacity expansion. And, um, I uh, will uh, focus mostly on the results uh, from the last paper. I think Joao is among us. It's the most systematic approach to the to this new framework. And what the um, essential idea is to perform an opacity expansion, so to say, on top of the harmonic oscillator solution, by the assumption that uh, this is a Mueller expansion where one assumes that this scale here is much larger. Than, uh, than the screening mass. And, and uh, therefore one can consider this delta V, which is the second term as a perturbation. And the opacity expansion uh, can be expressed as, as it is customary as it was developed in the, in the early thousands as a Dyson-like uh, equation where, uh, where one builds up the expansion on top of the harmonic oscillator expansion in this the harmonic oscillator solution, not on the vacuum solution. So this is a cute idea. And 
uh, one can actually compute uh, systematically corrections up to an arbitrary order in delta v and check the convergence and, um, and many other aspects. For instance, that this q square scale, which a priori seems undetermined, it can really be constrained uh, when one realizes that this artificial separation it has to uh, uh, it has to disappear. The, 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 the result has to disappear. The, the dependence on Q square has to disappear when all orders are included. This was uh, uh, shown in this paper by Joao, Joao and Yassin that the, in order to, at, the, at, each, at each order in the expansion, to have uh, corrections that depend on uh, Q square that are subleading at that order one needs to have that this scale q, uh, this scale q to, the, to, to the fourth to be uh, expressed in this way. And it actually corresponds to the transverse momentum acquired by the radiated blue. One. And uh, it's actually the, the natural scale uh, in physical terms. This, uh, this specifically, this leads to a, an effective value for q hat that reads like this. And the solutions for this improved opacity expansion at, uh, at the lowest order is the harmonic oscillator approximation, is the harmonic oscillator solution as by construction. And then one gets uh, this first correction, which actually aims to uh, capture the, the, the high KT part of the potential. These, are, these equations are squared because are the ones that we're going to include in, our, uh, in the analysis I will show later. Um, here, I will qualitatively show um, the results for that one obtains using the improved opacity expansion. Um, many of the physics regarding uh, these regimes, they can and need to be understood in terms of uh, the coherence time, the time it takes for an emission to the cohere from the from the, uh, from the parent parton. In the medium, the accumulated transverse momentum uh, uh, along this coherence time is proportional to the jet quenching parameter with uh, GV square over Fermi units and one can see that this leads to a coherence time that doesn't have a collinear divergence and that uh, actually makes very soft gluons to emit it very copiously, uh, rapidly. Here in this picture, there is um, the leading order result in dash with the MPS, the harmonic oscillator. The GLB result in green and uh, the NLO term in the improved opacity expansion and the NNLO, uh, which has been uh, matched uh, accordingly for consistency with the rest of the results. Um, there is um, a very low energy regime, which is the best highlight regime, where the coherence uh, uh, time, the, the emission time of a, of a potential emission is of the order of the mean free path. So therefore, the emission rate scales like the number of scatterers. This regime actually corresponds to gluons that have a very soft energy, uh, which in this plot, which is omega over omega c in the x-axis, they would be really, uh, it, it would correspond to a very small portion of, of the total spectrum. And then, up to omega c, or which is the maximal maximal energy that an emission can have due to multiple uh, scatterings. In the BDMPS regime, it corresponds to having information time which is larger than the uh, mean free path, and therefore the, the, the spectrum uh, scales like the number of uh, coherent uh, coherent the number of scatterers uh, over a given coherence time. And it has a different scaling than the beta Heidler. And it uh, approximately is valid up to this, or dominates up to uh, omega C. 
approximately. Then in the GLB regime, this is when the energy is greater than omega C, but the LPM suppression that, um, so uh, the LPM interference affects that suppress emissions with a formation time longer than the medium length. This enforces that there needs to be a minimum uh, transverse momentum, and this is clearly greater than the so-called saturation scale, which corresponds to the amount of transverse momentum acquired through multiple scattering. So clearly, this, as we were saying before, this corresponds to the single scattering regime. And it uh, it's enough to, for the typical scaling, it's enough to consider the high KT part of the potential because it's high KT. And then you, one can see that it has a, this scaling with the omega. So it's interesting to see that improved opacity expansion does what it's supposed to do, which is interpolate between the leading order and the next to leading order are the correct scales. And also interesting to see that the next to next to leading order term is much more than the other ones, and it can safely be ignored to most of our phenomenological purposes. Now, when we speak of a jet, a jet has a an angular size defined by the reconstructed uh, reconstruction radius. So when we speak about energy loss of a jet, uh, we actually are interested uh, not only on the energy of the gluon, but also the final angle where it ended up. If, it, uh, what, if it's still in the jet cone, one should not consider it to be uh, spectrum of gluons that contribute to that jet energy loss. So in this uh, in our recent paper, we took a multiplicative ansatz. Instead of solving the, the fully uh, numerical, the, the full differential spectrum numerically, which one can do as a, in, in, a, in a very precise and sophisticated way, like uh, I know you, you have done, you know, the work from uh, Xavier and Carlota and collaborators. And it, many, many of these comparisons against the fully numerical results should be done, would be interesting to be done. Here, however, we're mostly interested in, the, in, in having a, some sort of control over the different approximations and the contributions of the different terms to the problem. So this multiplicative ansatz it assumes that one can get the spectrum of gluons out of the cone by having the spectrum of gluons for any omega time some term that takes into account the the broadening that uh, that uh, the probability that uh, an emission with uh, with energy omega has gone away from a jet of energy r given a, a specific broadening characteristic broadening scale so this term here uh, is defined like this, as can be inferred from the upper equation. And it features the broadening distribution, which through evolves through kinetic theory like this, as it is well known. And uh, it's driven by elastic collisions, uh, which broaden uh, the, the distribution. And this characteristic uh, broadening scale, it, uh, it uh, it depends on the kind of processes that we're talking about. The, the dominant uh, broadening process that we're talking about regarding the, the, the energy loss regime that we are in. For instance, for, for, uh, for small kicks, uh, when, when the transverse momentum is uh, much smaller than a given uh, scale that's to be defined, one expects to have a, a Gaussian distribution for the for the for the acquired transfer momentum, just an accumulation of random kicks, of small random kicks in the large um, transverse momentum, one expects that it should be dominated by the one k to the fourth tail of the of the elastic uh, scattering rate. Then one can use the Mollier uh, expansion. That uh, Molière developed uh, several decades ago. Danny, can I ask a question? Sorry. Can I ask you a question? Sure. 
uh, I it's very confusing to me this broadening in scale. Uh, starting with the, I don't I don't understand this b function uh, when when you integrate over p. What is that x? Is that is that rescale momentum or or is a longitudinal variable? I I I don't understand. Right, it's this um this I'm, would work. P depends on two different things, right? Depends on momenta and, and the length of the medium. So what is X? So X, it's, um, it's rescaled like this. It's omega times the, the, the radius of the jet, which would be like the transverse momentum of a, of a given emission, the transverse momentum of an emission that ends up outside of the jet cone, given R as this, uh, angular scale that defines the jet cone. And therefore, it is scaled over the amount of uh, broadening it receives uh, from the medium. So I agree, this is not absolutely transparent and this is an approximate ansatz. However, one can see that it does really describe the different regimes that one is interested in. So this, again, if that answers your question, this X is uh, rescaled by this uh, scale. It's the omega times R rescaled by this scale. Excuse, Daniel, excuse me, but Q squared broadening shouldn't be QS squared. Why uh, two different scales for the characteristic broadening of the medium? Yes, you are right. Um, so QS squared, that would, uh, correspond to the transverse momentum acquired through multiple subscatterings. And, and that, is, that is the regime that is well described at, uh, at low KT by, by this general formula. So um, if I may continue, perhaps let me, let me know if, if, if I'm not answering the question that, that you are asking. Um, this, uh, this leading order term here of the spectrum, which is harmonic oscillator uh, solution, it is dominated precisely by this QS square scale, like you were saying. So we are assuming that the, the broadening that affects the, um, the radiation due to the harmonic uh, oscillator approximation, it's as it in, a, in consistently, it's the broadening it gets, it's uh, Gaussian like. And the scale of that, uh, the width of that Gaussian is precisely QS, as you were saying. Uh, then for the next leading order term, which is dominated by the GLB behavior, um, these ansatz here allows you to, to, to correctly uh, get the high, uh, the high KT one over K to the fourth tail factor which is this here at high KT, at high omega, while also allowing for a smooth interpolation for what one would expect for the, for the Gaussian-like broadening when this spectrum tends to go to, towards, the, towards the energies at which it should be matched with the harmonic oscillator. So it, it, is, it is clear that uh, it would be more correct to use the fully numerical uh, solution. However, um, as I said, we were interested. Daniel, right. May I ask you a question. So I understand that that for the for the kernels or for the spectrum, you you don't use the full numerical, which is again it's more complicated. Let's say it's more demanding numerically. So, but why for the broadening? You you use the Gaussian for the for the leading order and the other term for the next two instead of using just the full numerics for the broadening because the broadening it's very easy to do the numerics. Yeah, again. I agree. So it's it's not a matter of for us it's not a matter of uh, uh, numerical difficulty which which I believe you it uh, it, it has some. It it was a matter of uh, achieving uh, simple expressions. And, um, but but the, the, the full expression, I mean, the broadening, the full solution for the broadening without approximations is just a Gaussian. You just need to Fourier transform this. Yeah, that's fair I mean, enough. I understand that probably it's not totally correct to use the full solution for the broadening and 
the, the, the opacity expansion for the rest, but I don't know which is more correct to, to mm. do that or to introduce this scale and do the, the broadening in two parts. Right, so in principle, the, the broadening is a, is a single expression that it follows the same logic as the improved opacity expansion. And what we are doing here is uh, modifying the relevant scale such that the appropriate behaviors are described where they're supposed to be described. So then, you're exactly right. Then I, I don't understand what is the point of having a formula that interpolates between the, the two regimes if you're going to split it later and consider, the, consider them separately. What is the point of having the improved opacity expansion if you're going to do it just as harmonic plus GLV and, and, treat, them, and treat them differently? Um, well, that's a good point. In the end, we're actually uh, using different scales for the two parts uh, in order to reproduce the right behavior. Um, you're saying one could have easily simply put uh, the, but you know, okay. What I'm saying is that the, the advantage of having this uh, improved opacity expansion is that you can have both things at the same time, that you can, you have one formula that supposedly uh, has the, uh, the features of GLV and also the features of VDMPS all in one expression. But then you split it in the two terms anyway, and you treat the two terms differently. The improved opacity expansion makes sense if you, if you sum the zero contribution and the one contribution and you treat the whole thing as a whole. Otherwise, you're not really using the, the advantages of having the, the improved opacity expansion. You could just easily have done, have said, I use BDMPS for this region and I use GLB for this uh, region. So uh, I, 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 don't, I don't get why you, you want to throw away something, the, the nice feature of the expansion that you have. Right, I mean, what we're doing is almost that, uh, with the exception that uh, um, once omega is very large, um, it does not suffice to use this QS square to describe the high KT uh, broadening. One really needs to add this in order for the correct, uh, correct uh, behavior to be obtain, then if this QS square, um, it's actually obtained also from an implicit equation, so it's not fixed. But yeah, you're right, I take your point. Um, we, sh we should have, uh, have uh, simply found the QS square that for each omega gives us the right scale in a natural way. Okay, yeah, yeah, I agree. I agree with your point and, uh, and um, I'll see if this can be improved in some okay. way. Yeah. No, you, you can go ahead. It's, it's good. Yeah, thanks. Thanks for the comments. So, right. Okay, I'll, I'll think about it. <laughs> Not now. Thank you. And okay, so now we have the ingredients for um, out of cone emissions spectrum that depends on the jet radius, but that's for a single charge. Um, let's focus on uh, what the quenching factor for that single charge would be. So it has been uh, known for a long time that uh, one can uh, express the uh, obtain a quenching factor for the vacuum spectrum by assuming that uh, that it uh, steeply falling, the high power of N, and the energy losses are small. And then one can define this uh, quenching factor here. Then once you have uh, multiple independent emissions that follow a Poisson distribution, one can show that uh, the distribution for the quenching factor reads like this. And now what we've done here uh, in this paper is to separate uh, two uh, contributions for the induced spectrum. These would be um, from uh, gluons emitted with a scale T up to omega S 
and from omega s uh, up to infinity. This omega s is the, the soft scale, the soft gluon scale, and it determines the onset of uh, order one emission probability, where the gluons undergo turbulent cascade and one assumes that they rapidly thermalize. Um, these soft gluons are dominantly produced by the, by the leading order spectrum. And therefore, it, up to omega s does not make sense really to include the higher order terms, although uh, one could not include them. But uh, just for clarity, uh, it's clear that they are dominated by the lower part of the, the leading order part of the spectrum. And one can further go ahead and make some assumption about the amount of those thermalized gluons that stay inside your cone. And for that, the exponent of the Laplace transform here is modified uh, such that it captures that physics. So recall that uh, was uh, known or and also shown first here in this paper, that the amount of energy loss can be expressed uh, in this way. Um, it, it's actually, you can show that it's the derivative of this term with respect to the new exponent evaluated at no equal to zero. This, you can see that this corresponds to the total amount of energy emitted from between these two values and that it's modulated by this factor here, which is that just the multiplicative factor in front of the new exponent. And you can see that if uh, the radius is equal to the recovery radius, then there wouldn't be energy and in any energy loss at all. And for uh, uniformly distributed, uh, for, for, for gluons or for, yeah, for those gluons that have thermalized and they are uniformly distributed in the jet hemisphere, this recovery parameter would be of the order of pi, actually pi halves. And the, the scaling goes like a square because it's, a, it's an area. So again, this is a very crude modeling of the non-perturbative uh, part. Uh, however, it does to some degree account for the fact that thermalized energy, some of these will still remain inside the jet cone. Then for emissions above omega s, we simply use the full spectrum. Now it comes the question of which is in the given jet, which is the actually quenched phase space. And the very convenient way to ask this question and to depict it is by using the Lund plane. This is one of the possible uh, representations of that plane where emissions correspond to points in this 2D diagram as a function of the angle and the energy fraction with respect to the parent parton. And it has been uh, already uh, well discussed in the literature. Uh, Yasin, Conrad, and also uh, this paper by uh, Paul Yanko and collaborators. And that there is a, a phase space of the jet, a phase space of vacuum-like emissions that are resolved by the medium and that contribute to quenching. And in a nutshell, these are basically those emissions that have been formed inside the medium and those emissions that are resolved by the medium. So um, two charges uh, or uh, two charges that are, uh, that have a common uh, originator, they will start behaving like independent color charges due to uh, color rotation by the medium around the decoherence time. And that's when, that's when uh, the medium can resolve these two emissions and therefore each of them can contribute in some limit independently uh, to energy loss. So these are the contributions that contribute to the double logarithmic enhancement of the quench phase space. Phase space in the medium resolved by the, phase space of the gen resolved by the medium and it uh, goes like this. It depends on the critical angle, um, minimum angle that an emission can have to be medium induced. And also the, the radius of the jet 
and the pt of the j. So this is a very important ingredient when one needs to resum the effect of different uh, of the of, of the different quantum factors, the different legs of a jet that contribute to energy loss. And it can be shown through the generating functional framework that the quenching factor resumes in a form that is very similar to the Diglap equation. It's like a Diglap equation where the legs have been dressed uh, with quenching uh, in some sense. These are the unregularized alternative policy splitting functions. And this is the phase space that I was describing in the previous slide that contains these conditions such that a given vacuum like emission contributes to energy loss as a source of energy loss. And in essence, this is, this is something that um, it, it, uh, it matches very well to, our, to, to, our, uh, to the notion from Monte Carlos that I was describing uh, at the beginning of the talk. So the initial condition at zero angle is the bare quenching factor. The quantum factor of a single charge. That's um, it has contributions from both the radiative energy loss and elastic energy loss, which they factorize in Laplace space. And the elastic energy loss is a uh, model through the E hat uh, uh, parameter. It is related to Q hat in a weakly coupled plasma through the fluctuation dissipation relation, and it also con contains these. Um, recovery of the energy modulation here due to the angular uh, distribution of the thermalized modes. So now one can see the differences between having the bare quenching factor, which would be like assuming a jet is a single charge that is never resolved, <coughs> and there is some quenching factors. So we speak first about the bare quenching factors, these uh, dashed, uh, curves here, you can see that um, uh, a lower quenching factor means more quenching. And for there is less quenching for larger radius because it is uh, more likely that, an em that a given emission is inside the jet cone if the cone is larger. This applies both to induced emissions that have broadened or the angular distribution of the thermalized modes. Then we have uh, the, when once we include the resumation of the different legs of a given jet, the larger radius can lead to more quenching. And this is due to the interplay between the energy recovery that dominates the effect of the bare quenching factor and the fact that the quench, that the phase, the quench phase piece of the jet increases with increasing R as one would naturally expect. And yeah, this was also discussed in uh, my paper where, where I included the different contributions to energy loss uh, using the hybrid model. So um, now I would like to um, conclude by uh, showing which are the steps necessary to produce uh, results that can be compared to data, which is the procedure we follow we use PTA8 to generate the spectrum at the initial matching scale, uh, angular scale equal to one, where we use the nuclear PDFs, uh, EPS09 at leading order for the medium case. Then we evolve the micro jets using the vacuum, the GLAP evolution down to the angular scale of the jet. Then we need to compute the resum quenching factors at each value of the jet PT and radius. And this bare quenching factor requires knowledge of uh, event by event centrality dependent QGP properties. So what we do is we embed this framework into a realistic heavy ion environment where we have like uh, thousands of samples of jets. Each of them has been created in a different part of the transverse plane according to a global sampling with a random azimuthal orientation. Then what we do is we integrate along the path of the jet in the local fluid rest frame, along the path of the jet, the important uh, quantities that are needed for, 
for the for the computation of the bare quenching weights and the phase space and the quench phase space. For example, here the length uh, is simply expressed like this, or the value of q hat, which gets a well-known uh, correction factor due to flow effects. Danny, I have a question here. Mm -hmm. uh, this um, the, this this q hat, uh, the way that you calculate is like the average. It's like an average q hat or the trajectory, right? But uh, in previous implementations uh, where people use um, uh, these uh, harmonic approximations and these kind of things, uh, what they saw for this, what they call the scaling loss is that you, you shouldn't use an average you had, you should use like the average omega C. So it's like that you actually integ you don't integrate Q hat or the trajectory, you integrate, you, you, you do an integrate an integration weighted by the um, um, by the length. So instead of calculating what is the integral of the q hat over the trajectory, you calculate the integral dt of t times q hat of t. You understand what I mean? I'm not sure to which degree what you're saying is so different from this. Cause it would be like the like the zero moment and the other one the first moment. So. This would be like dx x q hat or dx q hat that integral. So, so is, this is related to the fact that uh, that in the bidding MPS uh, setting, the the energy loss goes like l square, mm -hmm. like l, right? So it's it's in the same in in the same idea. So in the old uh, Quenching weights paper by Carlos Anurs. They they show that the scaling loss to go from an expanding medium to an uh, to the corresponding static case, you have to do it with the uh, matching the omega c, not matching the q hat, and the and the difference is 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 noticeable, is sizable. So mm -hmm. I don't know if you explore this or or why you chose to to match the q hat and not the omega c. Well, I mean. We also do this same thing for omega c, for all the quantities that uh, have a different scaling. So omega c goes like uh, um, q hat zero to the l square, right? So um, we actually compute omega c in a similar fashion. Like you would get, I, I don't have the equation here, um, but we, we would compute omega c using the integrand that you see here, times uh, L square. And then we compute omega C in this in the same fashion. So these are just two of the quantities that we compute. So I believe that we have covered all, all the different scalings. So to the degree that Q had, because these, these different quantities enter, enter the computation at different, at different points. And it, it's not like this suffices. We also need to compute, for instance, the screening mass and it, it has a different scaling, it's like uh, t square. It doesn't have the flow factor. We also need to compute theta c, which has a different scaling, like uh, q hat l cube. And we compute all of those. Yeah, we decided to remove those from, from the supplemental material, uh, but, uh, but that, I, I see that it, it, it is indeed confusing. I don't know if, if you would agree that to some degree we are doing uh, exactly what you're suggesting to do. Or I, no, I, I think it's not the same, but I have no idea how, how big will be the effect of doing one thing versus the other. Mm. Um, so, and just another, another related question. You, you use the uh, proportional sign. You have like an extra parameter there for, for your fits or something or? or, or no, it's just, it was just to, to, to simplify uh, the expression. We, we just wanted to show the, the, the scaling that is relevant to the embedding. But here there are some factors of G, G met. Uh, we call G met, but it, it's a fix. We don't let the coupling with the medium run. Uh, I, I will speak about it right now, but yeah, there are some numerical factors here which are not relevant to this precise discussion. Okay, thanks. Yeah, thanks. Um, so after we have uh, constrained many of these uh, of these uh, parameters event by event through through uh, through the embedding in a in expanding hydro, 
we uh, end up with two unconstrained parameters, this recovery uh, parameter that we vary between pi halves, which would be like isotropic, and uh, this slightly less isotropic value, which is uh, inspired by the results from the wake. Um, for instance, one can, one can very easily compute the, how it scales with the, with the radius, the amount of energy recovered due to the, due to the expansion, due to the wake uh, with a given R. The wake is the, the perturbation on the medium induced by the jet, the hydrogen dynamics modes. And uh, you can see that, that this value uh, very closely matches uh, sense results. However, in the absence of background flow, this is, this is important, I will highlight later. If there is background flow, this, the, the answer is not uh, universal. So this, this is chosen to be varied between these, these two values, just to gain some sensitivity on, on what the effects of the recovery of energy are. And then uh, the most important value is this GMET, uh, it is like uh, it enters the Q hat zero, precisely, as you were saying, and we fit this value here for Atlas data, radius of 0.4, 0 to 10% centrality. And it, uh, it ends up being uh, between 2.2 and 2.3, which results in a average value of Q hat zero, which is uh, quite small due to the effects of the flow. Uh, but due to the logarithmic corrections that uh, only show up once uh, you uh, consistently include uh, the two different parts of the, of the spectrum, the different contributions to the full spectrum, after logarithmic corrections, you get a rather large value with a rather large uh, critical uh, energy. Um, we can see that there's a good description of both the centrality and the jet PT suppression for radius of 0.4. Then the uh, radius dependence, we can take the double ratio of RAJs, and this is in qualitative agreement with CMS data. However, the our point two uh, it stands out compared to the compared to the rest, and in CMS uh, it doesn't it does not stand out so much. Okay, uh, qualitatively speaking, we have a very moderate um, R dependence, which uh, is indeed in agreement with the data. And then another important thing that we can do from our study is given that we have these, um, these uh, so to say, well separated um, or well controlled uh, uh, modeling, or at, at least we, we know which the different parts of our computation are exactly, we can see what the effects on the REA are, for instance, focusing on radius of 0.2 and 0.6 by varying a set of parameters. So we can uh, highlight that the NLO contribution is very small because the hard emissions tend to be collinear. However, it does to some degree improve description of high PT. It's important for the description of high PT. The modeling of the fit of the lost energy where you, where you see that we vary this between one and infinity, which would mean full, uh, no energy loss for radius of one or or uh, no recovery at all for any radius, the effects are relatively small for relatively small radius. So what this means that the biggest effect is actually here the determination of the phase space. This uh, theta c or the coherence time uh, has been computed to leading logarithmic accuracy and the, the factors are not uh, very well constrained if one assumes that this theta value of theta c varies by a factor of two, the effect is pretty large. So this means that there are reasons to try to improve the perturbative sector uh, before um, having to surrender to the non-perturbative sector, at least for, for small radius. Uh, a bit more data comparison. Um, you see, it's actually nice, the description of Alice at the small pt, uh, but CMS, um, uh, it's a bit too, uh, with, with, we, we get too much suppression compared to CMS. This could be perhaps because we chose Atlas data to fit. This is a known tension that would be interesting to be resolved. However, um, I think uh, the results are um, okay. So now before I finish, I would like to to, to, to discuss a bit uh, how one can improve the non-perturbative sector, which 
we know it's important when we look at substructure observables, such as, for instance, as an example in this paper from uh, Achivan and friends, where they show that the wake and the thermalized modes do have an impact on substructure observables, such as the jet shape, or in this other paper where, that, uh, where I showed that uh, when one looks at a large R, um, the energy recovery becomes uh, very important, and also the interplay between the two excited wakes of two back-to-back -back jets and can also have a, an important effect when the jets are aligned in rapidity. So there is more to the non-perturbative sector or to the thermalization, the fate of the thermalization than just simply the REC parameter. However, it does seem that for small radius and for inclusive observables such as the, or clustered observables such as the jet energy is not so important. But if one wants to go to larger R, it will be, uh, uh, crucial to improve this hydrodynamic modeling. And uh, here I would like to show um, what actually happens when you consider that you have a 10 GB quark, single quark that is oriented along a, a black arrow and for different initial configurations or and different orientations, you can get really widely different distributions for the azimuthal angle, the PT, the, how hard the, the, spe the, the spectrum of the particles from the wake is, and also the rapidity distribution. Some cases to get a double peak in rapidity due to the uh, diffusion of the sound modes. And the most important uh, part, uh, the most important effects that actually determine the shape of the thermalized energy or hydrodynamized energy, it's the evolution time of the, the deposition until the freeze out and the local background flow at the freeze out. So we are now working on, on extending the linear wake uh, plus local boost procedure that we published some months ago, such that we get a full emulation comparable to hydro and the results are promising. This is uh, produced with, uh, with full hydro, but the results using this uh, linearized approach um, are very, very similar. So this can be very useful, for instance, for inputs for any model that assumes that there's a part of the energy that has been hydrodynamized and wants to know which would be the consequences in, a, in the final, in the final uh, jet energy. You see if the jet has been, the energy has been deposited uh, really in a very boosted area that didn't have time to develop, then um, it, it, it might be that the distribution, angular distribution is very narrow and much of the energy is still in the cone. This can also be useful for tomography application. So, yeah, with this, I move to my conclusions. I know perhaps I was started a bit late. Let me just quickly flash through this. We completed the inclusive jet suppression analytically, where we resumed energy loss due to the quench phase space of a jet that includes coherence effects. And we have embedded this into a realistic heavy iron environment which is uh, really necessary in the event by event fluctuations. Computation really differs from the average one, which is also crucial. We achieved a good data description, which is encouraging, although many uh, improvements uh, need to be made to this framework, can be improved systematically. Um, we can see that the non perturbative sector is relatively unimportant and the termination of the phase space is the main source of uncertainty, which motivates uh, uh, future work on going beyond the logarithmic accuracy for the computation, for instance, of the decoherence time. For larger cones, we need realistic hydrodynamic modeling and um, all the, the background flow, the effect of the background flow is really determinant when one wants to know the shape of the hadrons coming from the wake. So, well, thank you very much for your attention and questions and comments. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Daniel. And, and I don't know if there is uh, any question. I have a, I have one question. Okay. Can you? Yes. Uh, yes. Uh, Danny, thank you very much. Uh, I have one question. Could you go back to the definition of the microjets? And then in, go to slide 23. Is that, I don't have it clear. What exactly a microjet is? It's, um, it is the, 
is like a fragmentation function, okay, up to a scale t. But what is the scale? What is this scale? I mean, is the the the, the, the I have a difficulties to picture what exactly this is. Uh, so you start with a jet with let's say radius r, and then you want to compute the number of constituents or the distribution of constituents with a given momentum fraction of the energy of the total jet. Up, up to the angular scale that you have chosen. Yeah, up okay, to the, up. So with the number of constituents with the scale t. Uh -huh. With let's say size uh, concise theta inside a jet of concise r, yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. So uh, well, uh, thank you very much. Now I think I get it. But then, can you go to twenty three? Because simply, I mean, uh, well, was it twenty three? Maybe it was twenty two. Excuse me. Ah, no, no, no. It was twenty three. Twenty three. Sorry, yes. Why do you evolve using the glove? I mean, you have a jet spectrum, but if you use the glab uh, to, to evolve, to get the micro jets, you're assuming that you decouple completely from the medium. Well, yeah. Went, I, I mean, I know this is in the spirit of the, of the hybrid, that you decouple vacuum radiation from medium, but... Well, it's, it's, it's only that, um, so first, um, yeah, I wanted to add a picture here that would have been helpful. So first imagine that you have a, the initial parton, and then assume that you have an angular tortoise shower. So essentially, um, it will emit stuff, first large angle, then smaller angle, okay? Then um, let's say that you choose a given R. So the, the quenching associated to that jet it can only be due to the things that are inside that jet. You, 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 this, this would break factorization in some sense, such that if, if you quench uh, things that happened before the jet definition itself was done. What I'm saying is if the, you will have emissions that happen at larger angles than the radius of your jet, right? Yes. That is vacuum energy loss, so to say. And uh, these emissions that happen uh, before, before the uh, angular scale of the jet are reached, this, this one should not be quenched. This, this, would, this would lead to over quenching. But in the medium, how do you know that the evolution is simply given by the GLAP uh, by entirely by easy vacuum splitting functions? Well, oh, you're saying, you're saying you define the jet in the medium. You don't define it in the vacuum and then modify right. it. You, you're talking about um, uh, having higher twist corrections to the vacuum uh, evolution. No, 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 no. I'm talking about the fact that the, the definition. I mean, the jet that you measure is in the medium. You're kind of. A, I know you do it in the hybrid, but uh, this is assuming a completely couple of vacuum radiation from medium effect. Well, right. The thing is, um, how there is there is a part of the of the jet shower or or the, the jet evolution that is dominated by uh, vacuum physics, and um, because you know it takes some time for the medium induced emissions to kick in, and they have a characteristic uh, scale or that that is much lower typically than the virtuality scale that comes from the from the initial hard scattering so there is i, I agree this this can be improved but there is, there is a part of the shower that essentially happens in a vacuum like fashion no i i, I agree but then then okay never mind I, I mean i don't see that in the ziklap evolution at least you have to take into account the fact that angular ordering may be break, uh, broken in the middle so right. you have a full angular order evolution Right to, it, to whatever it takes. It will. It, and that, that assumption may well break in a thick medium. Right. So it's true that we assume that uh, the vacuum evolution happens in an angular order way. However, um, 
However, for, for angular ordering to be broken, one needs to reach first the decoherence time. And, um, and in order to reach the, the decoherence time, that's, the, that's precisely the time at which medium emissions kick in. And therefore, that's when the onset of medium effects actually happen. So medium effects happen uh, after, uh, medium effects do not happen during the angular order part of the shower. So okay. therefore, you can, you can assume that the vacuum-like part happens in an angular order fashion. This, this was more okay. precisely discussed in the, in the Yanku paper. Yeah, so you assume that the medium is not able to, to resolve the jet down to jet R. You assume that. And then you start the quenching things. Right, because then you see if if the jet had uh, an uh, an angular scale which is smaller than theta c. Okay, but this is not exactly what you're asking. Okay, I think I see your point. It, sorry, Danny, I, I'm 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 a little lost here. Uh, I understand the general uh, idea, but uh, I, I think uh, in this in the same. Uh, uh, line that Nestor questions are going. Uh, how exactly does the quenching factor enters? I mean, how do you convolute it with the with the micro jets? I, I... Yeah, so I didn't show the details about this, but um, you, you can use the generating functional, and it's. It's the, the micro gen distribution has a like a different normalization. It's not normalized to one, but it's normalized to the quenching factor. And in that way, you see that it it it's really analogous to the to the micro jet uh, evolution, but uh, with a, with a different normalization. And that normalization is taken into account by the by the initial condition. I I didn't show the details about this. And um, yeah, Yasin and Conrad. They, they will present the, this framework they have been working on uh, for a long while. They haven't still uh, produced the paper, but all the details will be in there. Uh, no, but, uh, I'm asking this because I'm, uh, uh, I'm not sure if you're familiar with a, with a paper by, by Felix uh, Ringer or Ringer. I don't, I don't know how to pronounce his last name with, uh, with Pia and Nobuo and Jan Wishu, mm -hmm. uh, where they they, they yeah. have something similar like this. They have the jet functions and they, they propose like a modification of the jet functions and they, and they do a global fit to data. And I wanted to know if what you're doing is, is doing the same assumptions as, as that work or not, or and if you ever consider comparing your, your curves with, the, with, with what they get. I don't, I don't remember exactly. So uh, their assumptions. So there's a... Um... Well, Danny, I think I'm not sure because I, I'm 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 not sure if I'm understanding exactly how you do these things, but in general, Felix even not only in this paper but in some of his papers in soft collinear effective theory, I think he's doing something quite similar to what you're doing here because he always has the like uh, a vacuum shower evolve with the glap up to a scale. So I'm that's why. I'm not sure, but I think you're doing something very similar. So it would be um, nice to understand if there is some, like, because of course he doesn't have some quenching factor. He has something different in soft collinear effective theory. So it would be nice to understand if, if, if they enter in the same way or in something similar. Yeah, yeah. Um, they, they do have this um, semi inclusive jet function. It's like yeah. they, they correct the vacuum emission with a medium term, which is essentially the n equal one term. And they, they compute all the differences due to uh, due to a single gluon emission, and then they resend this in some way, which honestly it's, has never been clear to me. But yeah, I, yeah, I don't understand either the details, but I was wondering more about the, like the separation of scales and how you do first dig lap and the other thing, if if it's something like more or less equivalent or not. Mm. So it sounds similar. This, <laughs> this, uh, this, this. Uh, these papers on sketch, they, they do have some uh, some some dynamics and um, and uh, they have the, the, the physics of the, the energy loss. That other paper of the of the global fit, I don't remember exactly, but uh, I think that 
uh, I don't remember the details. I'm, I would like to come and I know them, uh, but they think I think it's what, different. What I remember is that they they they, they use the formalism, the, the vacuum formalism with the jet functions, but then they say, okay, let's assume that now the jet functions are modified. And and they do something like like this, a fit the, the the sort of way that you will do like with MPDFs. You just assume that there's some modification, and then you you fit that modification. They don't assume anything about how it is modified. They just fit it, right? So that there there are some assumptions in the sense that there's a separation of scales. But I was wondering if what they what those uh, that, that modification that they do for the for the jet function, if what they get will correspond to your quenching factors, or if it's a different thing, I, I'm 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 not sure. Um, let me let me because this is a very important uh, point. Um, yeah, I think that. I mean, can, can you clarify what is the difference between the jet function and the microjet? I'm I'm sorry, your voice broke. Uh, can you clarify what is the difference between the jet function and the microjet? No, I'm not. I'm not sure. Uh, I don't remember exactly the jet. Oh, the jet function understood that. Okay, I'm rescuing the paper. Okay, jet functions they do evolve like DGLAB to to that degree. It is <laughs> the same. Um, I don't know. But it it does look really similar. Uh, the jet function. However, I, I'm, I cannot say I, I, I can answer precisely. I don't know enough about the, this mm -hmm. other approach. I'm sorry. I, I think in this global field that Fabio was mentioning, what they do is like the modification of the, of the jet function would be like, like this nuclear fragmentation functions that PI used to have. So it's like just a modif So that's why I think it's important to understand how your, your quenching weights enter there. If it's like a convolution, probably it would be like, like the same thing. So what they fit, because for them it's just a fit, they don't assume anything. It's just they put a functional form and they fit the parameters. I, I don't think it's it is the same. Different. It's, it's really different. It's like the quenching weight you're getting, I guess. Like, like you, you are getting yeah. something that comes, that comes from the theory and what they are doing is just fitting the modification I and not trying to interpret it. I would I would say that what we are doing in in this paper is just the quenching weights of a jet. It's essentially that we compute the quenching weight of a jet, which, which should be the quenching weight of a jet. And uh, what and what I see in in their paper is a is a completely different thing. Um, it's like uh, it's like the there's yeah there's there's some as there's some uh, convolution of the jet function. Which would be like uh, some convolution on top of the of the vacuum-like fragmentation functions, and um, yeah, I guess to, to some degree, perhaps in, in some range, they, they are comparable, but uh, I, not directly. Not it's 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 really different. At least this paper. Then, yeah, what is the jet function and the microjet difference exactly? I don't know. I would like oh. to. Know. But <clears throat> what they do is uh, they do a parameterization of the modification at initial scale and then they evolve. So this is basically as what we do in nuclear PDFs. Uh -huh. In this uh, respect, uh, uh, the, um, it is different because you have a, a different, uh, so somehow the, well, I, I'm not, so we, we should know exactly what is the, dif the relation between macro jets and uh, jet functions and uh, yeah. et cetera. But uh, so you you don't modify the initial conditions of the microjet um, um, distribution, which is something I wanted to ask you. I don't know if you mentioned it. What is the initial condition of the DGLAP evolution? So the, the initial condition is the yeah yeah because it, instead of using let's say matrix elements, we use PKI eight, and instead of using simply the leading uh, the hard part that comes from the hard scattering we use uh we use the jet spectrum from pithia at radius one which is i, I said there's some sensitivity to this choice and, and the, the idea is that um the radius one captures the leading order part because you you could you could have other uh the three jets and so on so the, there, there's some sensitivity to the nlo uh, effects here in the at the, at the early stages of the shower. The initial condition, simply put, is, uh, is the PCI spectrum at angle one. 
without nuclear PDFs in PP and with nuclear PDFs in that lab. And then um, coming back to Nestor's question about whether we assume that the angulars, uh, that the shower is not modified up to, up to the quenching, which is the radius. Then the question is why don't we, what if there are medium effects that happen before the jet radius and we're not, uh, we're not considering. This will modify the, the, the microjet. Yes. The distribution within the microjet. Yeah, the question is, um, right. So we are assuming that it happens vacuum like until radius R and then the medium effects start there. However, if the medium R is small, why should we assume that uh, it happens uh, uh, through simply vacuum D lab until such scale? Well, uh, this will be important for substructure in particular. And then, so you are assuming that you have only one emitter. No? Sorry? You are assuming that you have only one emitter in the... Yeah. Where? In the cascade. Uh, only one... Uh, one uh, for, for, mid, for medium... For jet quenching, you, you have only one emitter if you have only one uh, microjet, I guess. Uh, right. You... Would, uh, would, the, would the quenching factors, right? Because you... you you don't have the uh, bare quenching factors. You do the, the, the you, you do some evolution for the quenching factors, right? Yeah. So um, the I think Carlos, what you're saying is if, if the radius was uh, smaller than theta c, then yes, then there is no evolution. There is no evolution of the quenching factor. But only in that case. However, however, I I, I need to think better on that fact that um, let's say that you evolve down to radius 0.2, but uh, let's say that theta c is above that, for instance. Oh, well, yeah, I think it doesn't matter in the end. I think, okay, I, I, I'll think about it, but uh, I, yeah, I think it's okay. Yeah, sorry, I, I, would, I would like to give you a more concrete answer, but uh, that's better not do it online. No, but thanks a lot for the questions. That's uh, really helpful. Thanks. You know, the, the, this, is, this is a nice, it's a really nice work. I mean, we, 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 we want to understand a little better what are the assumptions and what's going, what's going in because it's, some, some of the things are not clear and the paper is very short. So <laughs> it's good to ask you questions. Yeah. No, but this is clearly improvable, but um, I think it's, um, it's uh, the first time it is done in this way, uh, but it's clearly improvable in many, in many ways. I agree. And that's, uh, that's one, what one should do. Essentially, the idea was trying to extend the, the quenching weights that uh, you guys have developed, um, which has been successful for leading hadron, trying to extend it for, for jets. That's the essential idea of this paper. OK, so I think there are no more questions. So, OK, let's thank uh, uh, Daniel again for his nice talk and uh, thank you very much. <laughs> thank you very much. Yeah, thanks to you. Really, it was a very nice discussion. Okay. Yeah. Well, yes. I, uh, Miguel, if you can stay for a moment because I will stop recording and I don't know where, where it goes. Okay. <laughs> okay. Well, stay Thank safe, guys. Yes, same to you. Bye-bye. Bye. Thanks, Danny. Nice to see you. Thanks. Bye-bye. Bye. 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 Bye.